conducted in uh, in uh, uh, in Belgium where he pre- where they presented it about an 87 95 90.5% survival a lot has changed between the 90s and the 2000 and 2010 which is basically that uh, uh, enucleation of course stayed the same but instead of external beam radiation we moved to other forms of therapy and we have a much better vision potential with the types of treatment that we have now which is why it's very important that we discover this disease early as long as we discover retinoblastoma early, we are able to treat it with all sorts of things now which can then make sure that the disease does not progress and the child does not only lose their life but may also not go blind. So the genetics of retinoblastoma is important to know because that really saves sight in retinoblastoma more than anything else. Knowing that a white reflex is there may make the child survive but really the genetics of retinoblastoma is what makes the child survive. So uh, what makes a child uh, not lose the eye, not lose vision in the eye, let's say. So a little bit about the RB1 gene, the 13Q14.1 to 14.2 locus is the region for the gene. It codes for a protein that's called a PRB, which is, in, uh, uh, which is responsible for the E2F pathway, which controls cell cycle, which basically means that it acts as a gatekeeper. And if there is phosphorylation of the uh, protein, then it does not allow the... Uh, um, uh, progression of the cell cycle and hypophosphorylation would then allow something like that to happen. Of course, that's not the only... Uh, uh, inactivation of the RB gene is not the only way where uh, RB itself is, is inactivated. You can have a mutation of the gene, you can have mitogenic signals that cause the inactivation of the uh, PRB function, or you can have viral oncoproteins affecting it, or you can have other ways of inactivating the, G- the uh, protein in itself. And the other way around, the R- RB itself is not responsible only for the E2F pathway, but responsible for many other things, that, uh, many other pathways as well. So this type of interaction is something that is complicated in most of genetics, and that's something that needs to be learned, and it's not exactly what Nudson taught us, which is basically that RB1 causes retinoblastoma. Well, Nudson was not the one who discovered RB1, but he predominantly was the one who, who discovered the two-hit hypothesis, and he just did that by listing out the number of cases in uh, the uh, age of presentation of cases with bilateral disease and unilateral disease. What also surprised me when I saw this paper is he actually listed out real hospital ID numbers, which you can't do nowadays with our types of REBs. <laughs> So he brought out a curve, which basically the curve was with unilateral retinoblastomas all in squares and the, uh, sorry, unilateral retinoblastoma all in circles and bilateral retinoblastoma all in squares, which could then give a story. And this curve basically says that bilateral retinoblastoma occurs faster than unilateral does. And this curve then fit what the hypothesis was for a two-hit curve, which basically means that you need two mutations to make the curve look like this, whereas you need only one extra mutation to make the curve look like this. And with that, he hypothesized that you, you really need two hits to cause the retinoblastoma. So it, in, in simpler forms, hereditary retinoblastoma, all the cells in the body have one abnormal allele of retinoblastoma and one normal allele, and that gets knocked out in the tumor and causes the tumor earlier. Whereas for non-hereditary retinoblastoma, you need two normal alleles to go to two, two abnormal alleles and that takes a little long, longer to happen and that's why unilateral presence a little later than bilateral. Some other small points about the hereditary types of retinoblastoma is that the uh, uh, in sporadic hereditary retinoblastoma, uh, retinoblastoma, the allele that's most commonly affected is the paternal allele. So the one that's been a, a, inherited by the father seems to be the one that's more affected than the one that's inherited by the mother. We don't yet know why. The other thing that's interesting is that for the second allele to be knocked out, you need something that's called as a loss of heterozygosity event, which is more common than any of the other events to knock the second mutation out. So that basically means that this mutation copies itself into the other allele, and that's what causes the retinoblastoma to occur. So there are many mechanisms by which that occurs either mitotic recombination, gene conversion, hemizygosity, or non-disjunction. But an LOH event is the more common way of knocking out the only other mutation, the only other allele that was normal in the RB1 over there. So now to turn all of these theories on its head, uh, came along Dr. Galli, who basically said that uh, there are some proportions of retinoblastoma that don't occur because of a mutation in the retinoblastoma gene. 
and they, uh, and in those patients she she then detected that nmic was amplified more than any of the other uh, uh, things that she noticed which basically meant that uh, uh, in a small subset of patients where they where they do not have retinoblastoma mutated in the tumor itself you, if you have, have nmic amplification you can cause a tumor that causes something like retinoblastoma so in other words you don't not all retinoblastoma is now need to have the rb1 gene mutated there are some sub there are some cases in which this need not be true coming back to the more human aspect of things this is a little story of a family who the father had unilateral retinoblastoma a unilateral retinoblastoma traditionally is not always passed on in the family so he he uh, he had no idea that both his children were then predisposed to getting retinoblastoma the elder daughter was detected too late too late in a way that there was already metastasis outside of the eye the knee joint looked pretty much like this one one week before the child passed away that could have been an entirely prevented not only did if they had known that the father had had this type of a mutation in his blood they could have screened the two children for that but thankfully for the second child we detected the child early enough to save both the eyes vision is good in one eye vision is not so good in the other eye we could have probably saved vision in both the eyes had we known the mutation earlier and prenatally diagnosed this child to have a predisposition and started treatment as early as possible this mutation is unique to this family and that's not true of all the families many of the families have various mutations as is listed by uh, uh, the richter paper which basically says that uh, mutations can occur anywhere in the gene there's no hot spot in the retinoblastoma gene so there's no one place that you can really look for this to know that the family has a certain type of mutation why do we need to screen the family well the, the papers that talk a lot about reduced cost of care for the families not only outside of india but also in india because the risk to siblings and cousins do exist and prenatal diagnosis is now coming of age so much so that you can even look at circulating uh, fetal dna in the maternal blood so sometime soon we might not really need to take samples from the amniocentesis but can even just take Uh, uh the maternal blood while she is pregnant to then look for fetal circulating dna and look at may- maybe the rb1 gene in something like that the other thing is that the person who actually has a germline mutation will have a lifelong risk of other cancers such as osteosarcoma soft tissue sarcoma malignant melanomas so those that are surviving retinoblastoma are now starting to die from these other diseases because they didn't know that they were germline predisposed so it's very important to give that kind of information to the family and what do we do when we give that kind of information we tell them a whole sort of instructions that everything that's written here mostly to uh, uh, avoid unnecessary diagnostic uh, radiation and to have a diet rich in natural antioxidants i think we'd all survive a lot more if we did something like that as well one more minute oh i have a minute okay so i'm going to quickly run through um, skip the family stories and go to the important slides which is basically that uh, um some of the families that we run we ran only through the next gen sequencing and we would, we got some mutation results back on how many of those were germline in the bilaterals when other labs are detecting about 96% the labs that we sent to which does only next gen sequencing for a little bit uh gave us back about 87% of the results Now the thing is that we sent very few unilaterals to them but none of them came back as being germline the pick up rate for something like that is under 15% so that's a little rare maybe the pick up rate will improve with the uh, uh harvesting of fresh tumor and looking at the mutation there and then coming through after that so uh, basically in i'm going to put this whole slide out over here so when you look at next gen sequencing you should be very well aware that there is there are true positives to that true negatives to that we don't mind that at all but what we really mind are the false negatives and false positives when we're looking at false positives we're looking at uh, 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 reasons like mosaicism translocations deep intronic mutations and promoter region issues which need not really show up so the uh, gene is actually inactivated but it's not showing up in the form of a mutation and when you look at uh, 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 the reasons for false positive it could be that uh, uh, the test results hasn't been confirmed by another method which we usually use two methods to confirm a mutation over there we should always be aware of genomic variations and rarely report these as uh, uh, and, and make sure that they're not reported as potential mutations but remain to be reported as genomic variations 
So the last hurdle for mutation screening continues to be costs. The current costs are about 25,000 for a 90% detection rate and about 60,000 for a 97% detection rate. But what the patients really expect is far from that. They expect something like 2,000 to 10,000 rupees, which is much less than what we can really afford to give them at this point. And they expect a 100% accuracy. So really on both sides, we should meet somewhere in the middle. As in we might have to reduce the costs by increasing the numbers of screening that we do. And we should also reduce their expectations of what this test can do. And maybe the, the, the middle line is where we have to meet. And with that, I'd like to thank Karthik for allowing us to uh, for allowing me to present in this situation. Thank you. Thank you for a nice talk.